Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome to another episode of Weekly Used Gun Review. Remember, the point of this video is to strictly be educational. We are just gonna do a one to two minute overview of a bunch of different firearms, sort of little mini reviews lined up to give you guys an idea of different things that are out there on the market. Um, also guys, nothing in this video is for sale. Again, everything's strictly educational. Also, if you want to see any type of vlog type stuff, please go check me out on my new channel at Marksman Radio. There is a link in the description. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, first up in our number one spot, and again, remember the format of this is we start with the most common up to the more rare and less uh, less seen options in your gun stores. But anyway, uh, starting off as sort of a as a classification of firearms I'm gonna talk about. So the first one here is a Jennings Model 59. It is a nine millimeter with two magazines in the box. And the other one here is a Davis Industries P380. It is a 380 of course, a semi-automatic with one magazine. Now, when you see firearms like this, one of the first things that comes to people's minds or the first term is Saturday Night Special. So, the term Saturday Night Special was sort of started, it was in the New York Times article in 1968 about sort of a, uh, it was a story on the less expensive sort of criminal element type firearm that a lot of criminals tend to buy, use in a crime and then get rid of because there's not a whole lot of value in them. Uh, also, the term was very, popularly used in the 1968 GCA, the Gun Control Act. And what that was to do was to eliminate the importation of what was known to be cheap or inexpensive firearms. The number one company targeted by this was ROM out of Germany. They would later create a, a plant in Florida, I believe. Now that left the market wide open for other companies to come in, uh, such as Jennings, known as then uh, Brico Jennings, same company, uh, Davis Industries, Larson, uh, Sundance, trying to think of any others. Uh, th there are a couple more, two or three more, very inexpensive Raven Arms, or I'm sorry, Phoenix, Phoenix Arms, uh, that come up with these very inexpensive firearms are brand new on the market, tend to be in about the uh, $100 to $150 price point, sort of like the high point uh, that you see today. Now you always see firearms that are sort of in this configuration. It's a very sim similar construction design. If you look at them, they're made and function very much in a similar fashion. Uh, and on the used market, you tend to find these things. Now, the prices are kind of going up a little bit, about $100 and $150 is typically where you find these. Very, very, very inexpensive. Now, again, the Saturday night special, uh, the, the provisions there in the 1968 were at the time viewed to be very targeted at people of a lower socioeconomic scale, uh, obviously, because people who are on a very fixed budget uh, tend to be the people who would purchase these. It was actually done through studies and found that criminals did not tend to use these. They tended to want to use more quality and more reliable firearms. So the Saturday Night Special was really not a commonly used criminal firearm, at least through the 60s and 70s. And pretty much what you ended up doing was disenfranchising people uh, who were on the lower socioeconomic side of the scale where this is all they could afford. So by taking these out of the market, by uh, banning the importation, that's kind of what it was seen to attack. But of course, American uh, companies stepped forward and put out these similar low cost products, which are not illegal by any means uh, and definitely uh, hold a place on the American market today. But of course, like I said, anytime you see something like this, you think a Saturday night special, very inexpensive mouse gun. These sorts of things sell very quickly in our store. There's always people who are happy to pick them up just to have them because, you know, for a tank of gas, you can get it. You throw it in the glove box, have it as, you know, just a backup or just a fun plinker at the range. They are not wholly reliable, but still a lot of fun to take out and shoot and very inexpensive to own. So a lot of people collect these. It's cool when they come in. All right, next up is the quintessential single shot top break shotgun. And you guys are gonna see this sort of thing frequently on your used gun shelves at your local dealer. Now this one here is a Stevens Model 94C in 410 gauge, really nice functional shotgun. This one here is missing his trigger guard. These are not very expensive. They are everywhere. You do find them sort of a dime a dozen. They should be about, you know, the 75 to $150 range, depending on condition. Um, now, prior to 1940, companies like Stevens and Ivor Johnson would make shotguns like this, and because there was no requirements for putting serial numbers or anything like that on the firearms at the time, uh, typically you would have a lot of department stores purchasing this and then branding them in their own way. You would see things like Hercules and, and other type of branding that they would use. It's kind of common. You would see them on uh, little semi-automatic 22s of the era, era as well. 
Um, so sort of the department store special. Because of that, tons and tons and tons of these things were made. Uh, very popular. They started losing production and popularity in the era of the popularity of the pump and then the semi-automatic shotguns, especially as those became more and more affordable. Uh, stuff like this sort of waned off in popularity. Now there are a few companies who still make them today. Uh, and they are, of course, again, very, very inexpensive, even brand new. So if you are looking for sort of that rabbit or squirrel shotgun, uh, very inexpensive to get. You have pests around the house. You know, again, you should be able to pick something like this up for under $100 used in good functional condition. Okay, up next is another popular firearm that you will see pretty frequently in your gun stores. This is a Marlin Model 60. These have been produced since, of course, 1960 and are still being manufactured today. Now, these are really good competitors to the Ruger 1022. The 1022 came about in the mid 60s, about 64, 65. So they've had a pretty similar track record. Now, one way that the Marlin Model 60 shines over the 1022 is it is less expensive by quite a big margin. Uh, you could find these used for around the $100, $150 mark in lesser condition. A really good condition like this, they might go a little bit higher. Uh, new, you're going to find them at about the $200 mark. Now, the 1022 start off at a base price of around the $2 to 250 and they go quite high up from there. The biggest difference between the two, of course, are both some automatic 22s but this one does not have the provisions for a removable magazine. It is a tube fed right up here at the front. Whereas of course the 1022 has the rotary 10 round mag and the of course uh, detachable box 25 round BX25 magazine. Now this one has the scope on it. Really, really cool rifles. Uh, very functional. Uh, one of the classic staples, of course, between this and the Ruger 1022. They pretty much hold the market in the semi automatic 22 uh, arena of things. So, pretty popular. When you find one, pick it up if it's at the right price. Really good little plinking rifle, little small game hunting rifle. Uh, just a classic overall design and a really good seller. Okay, up next, I have a set of classic Old West revolvers, but these are both 22s. Uh, this one is a high standard double nine. It is a double action type of firearm. Typically, it's a well, double single action. Typically, when you find these sort of cowboy type frame firearms, they are typically single action only, like the Colt Single Action Army. This particular one, of course, is also double action, getting the term double nine, nine, as it does have a nine round capacity. Now, these particularly have gone up quite a bit in value. They are hovering between about the three to $400 price point, believe it or not, but a lot of the high standard products are actually climbing. There are a lot of collectors who like their products, especially in the 22 flavor of things. Now, this one here is a Haas, uh, Haas da, 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 Firearms Company, and these are manufactured in Germany. Again, they take the stylizing and the function uh, more of a cowboy six shooter. Now this one is single action. The previous owner, it looks like, maybe fashioned a set of wood grips on here to fit. There's a little bit of wood fill here on the bottom. Um, overall nice condition. These sort of German imports, uh, things like these, don't bring a huge amount of money between about $150 to $250, depending on condition. Of course, these are gonna be a little bit more like the original design of a single action army, as opposed to both the Ruger Wrangler and the Heritage. Uh, Rough Rider. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit more, more true to form, this is sort of a cool option. Uh, this is probably the first and only one I've seen before. Typically you get a lot of these sort of copy, uh, clone type, inexpensive, low caliber firearms out of Germany and Italy, sort of these copy types of things. So uh, cool to see this type of stuff come in. Of course, there's always a market on the cowboy six shooter type of look and feel of things. Uh, these definitely, these types of things do not last very long. All right, next up I have a kind of a unique one. This is a Llama 380 Especial. This is a Spanish company and Llama has been around since about 1904, 1905. Now this here is basically a scaled down 1911 and a 380 configuration. So basically if you took a 1911 and shrunk it down. Now if you remember two or three weeks ago, I did have a Rock Island Baby Rock which looks exactly like that and that's where that gun drew inspiration from was this design here. Now for what they are, they actually are really affordable and something like this in this type of condition, you're looking at about the two to three hundred dollar mark, about the 250 mid two somewhere around there. Whereas the Baby Rock is gonna be about a hundred dollars more than that. So if you want something a little bit more classic and sort of the original design. They are not that expensive and you can find them around on the internet. Llama is really well known for their really inexpensive 1911s, the full frame guns. So it is really cool when you get stuff like this in. Actually really lightweight, small, kind of a classic looking, handles really nicely, does have the grip safety in the back just like a full size 1911. Single action functions exactly the same way. Nice trigger pull. Just a really cool little pistol 
and type, types of things like these always draw attention and they never sit around too long. Okay, up next I have a Norinco 1911 A1. Moving along with the theme of 1911s. This is basically in the style and configuration of the 1911 that was used in World War II. Very simple A1 configuration, smaller trigger uh, contours, uh, swelled out and ribbed mainspring housing. You have the World War II style sort of uh, polymer uh, slab side, um, like the keys fibrite grip panels is what I'm trying to say. It's sort of like a black oxide. It looks blued here on the frame, but more of a black oxide parkerizing here finish. Really cool, classic. These, believe it or not, uh, there's other firearms like this, like the SDI, uh, that are brand new and about the $450 mark. Now on the used market, these are hovering around about the same price, about the $450 mark. So there are buyers on these things. Now part of the reason for their value is the scarcity because of course these were banned from importation uh, during the uh, assault weapons and importation non-sporting firearm ban. I believe it was 1989, uh, but anyway, so these have not come in for a while. Classic cool firearm. Uh, again, if you're looking for something that is a little bit tougher to find, a little a little bit more with the rarity involved in it, and in a 19, 1911 A1 configuration, these the Renko 1911s are pretty cool. And uh, you know, I've seen them come in from time to time. This is maybe the third or fourth one I've had in here. So they are not remarkably uh, hard to come by. You can always see them for sale on Gunbroker, but still uh, sort of an oddity nonetheless. It's something we don't see every day. Okay, up next is something that actually uh, tends to be very popular in my store is the side-by-side -side variety. This one here is an Ithaca Hammerless. Ithaca side-by-side -side shotguns or Ithaca firearms in general uh, always seem to have a little bit of a draw to them. Um, they don't go for a super huge amount of money. Like they have the feather lights and you know the different variety of uh, that's basically what Ithaca was known for, was for their shotgun manufacturing. But these were popular, the side-by-sides, around the turn of the century and of course in the late 1800s as, 1800s as well, before you had a super wide prominence of the uh, of the semi-automatic and the pump action shotguns. Of course, you had the Winchester model 1897s and the uh, A5s and stuff on the scene. But the side-by-side -side sort of ruled the shotgun uh, market for quite a while around that time. Now, of course, side-by-sides would stay popular with people doing sport type shooting, uh, clay shooting, uh, hunting, uh, stuff like that today. And of course, these sorts of things stay very popular with collectors today who are very interested in sort of the Old West genre of firearms and like the sort of nostalgic appeal of a nice side-by-side -side shotgun. Uh, lots of different manufacturers made side-by-sides. Ithaca, of course, is one of the biggest known names uh, to be in this market, but really cool when this type of stuff comes in. It does not last very long, especially, you know, a lot of these things you typically find uh, with cracks and damage and that sort of thing. This one's really tight. Um, really nice shotgun, lots of patina. Looks like the stock's been refinished. I don't really see any cracks or anything, but it is a, uh, it's definitely been refinished. I can see some of the varnish there on the metal. Very, very nice. Cool to see this type of thing come in. Okay, up next is a Stevens 22410. Of course, it gets the name because it is a combination over under with a 22 on top and a 410 on the bottom. You guys have seen other sorts of uh, variations like this that I've had here on the channel. And of course, there are things that are manufactured like this today. This model would have come about in about 1939. There were some rumors, but not really any evidence, mainly speculation that this exact model was used by Air Force pilots in World War II as a survival rifle. Uh, whether that's been confirmed or not, there's really no data to suggest that that's true, but there is some anecdotal stories that pilots have come back and said, oh yeah, I've, uh, you know, we kept those in the cockpits of our bombers and whatnot. Now these sell in about the 350 to 450 range, depending on condition. Uh, something like this, which is actually overall pretty nice. Uh, this actually is supposed to have a polymer, polymer fore end and a wooden butt stock, no cracks or anything in the stock. Nice even patina wear on the firearm is probably in about 80 to 85% condition. Something like this, it is missing its rear sight. Would sell in about the 375, $400 price point and much nicer for condition they get upwards of 500 uh, so they are very affordable and a really classic option especially with being able to have a 22 and a 410 uh, a cool little hunting companion to go out on the trail with so really classic firearm 
Okay, and finally, I have a pretty popular one here. This is the Ruger Mini 14. Uh, this would come onto the scene in 1973 by Sturm Ruger, of course, and it was designed to basically mimic or be a scaled down version of the then popular M14. This is an investment cast receiver, wood furniture. They do make these in a polymer variant. They also have the Mini 30, which is a 762 by 39. The standard Mini 14 is a 223. Of course, later variations, the 556, if you will. These are meant to be popular with law enforcement and, of course, the civilian market as well. The ranch rifle really more catered towards the civilian market, the Mini 14, towards the military and police. But, of course, we could, as civilians, get either variant. They did make a fully automatic version of this called the AC556, which you can still purchase on the market today as transferable machine guns. But those are going to run you about eight, nine, ten thousand dollars dollars $10,000. These are fantastic clinking rifles on the range. Uh, the magazines for them can be pretty pricey, about $35 a piece if you get a Ruger branded one. Other companies like Metgar do make them at quite a bit of a uh, lesser price. This one here has a scope mount on it and some sort of uh, extended cooling. It was meant to be some sort of cooling device. I'm not too not quite sure how that works that the previous owner put on here. But Mini 14s, really, really cool, really popular. Some of the more classic ones with like the folding stocks can actually bring quite a bit of money, upwards of over $1,000. Uh, things like this with the fixed stock version, typically you see them around six, seven hundred dollars on the used market. Uh, new, they're going for about eight hundred. So the prices on these have come up. New, these things used to be five, six hundred dollars even not that long ago. So just like everything else, the price is rising, uh, as is the used market to follow. But they are, if you are looking for a uh, a Mini 14 or a 223, a varmint gun, anything like that, these definitely should not be overlooked. Very classic, very cool design, and of course, you know, Mini 14s. I love seeing them come in because. I know there's always buyers out there hunting for them. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button and also consider subscribing to my channel so you can see more content like this. Again, remember, if you want to see more political and business type vlogs, make sure to check me out on Marksman Radio. There is a button up here on the screen and a link down in the description. Anyway, guys, thanks for stopping by. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.